Hi and welcome to World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, I'm an undergraduate at Harvard University and I'm co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahl Bayt. Tonight we're both incredibly excited and fortunate to be joined by Rabbi Joseph Dweck, the senior rabbi of the British Sephardi community. In this episode, we talk about the flexibility of religious doctrine, reforms to religious practices, and these new anxieties about the reopening of places of worship in the face of coronavirus restrictions. First, we discuss how Imam Razavi and Rabbi Dweck have felt their roles, their responsibilities, their pressures as religious leaders evolve as coronavirus has increasingly taken hold. I guess leadership is, I guess, about two things I find in this current crisis. I think firstly is giving hope to a community which is on uncertain ground. So I guess this isn't something which we've experienced within our lifetime, or possibly within the last century. We do have examples of plagues within Abrahamic history. And sometimes I think it's important to go back and see how would, let's say, Moses have handled something like this. Or, for example, a um, hundred years ago when similar crisis befell Baghdad, how would Shi'i scholars have handled this particular situation? And I guess the first thing really is giving the community hope that there is light at the end of this. And however tense it may seem, but God's compassion and love and mercy is such that if we hold on to that, we can experience, as one would say, the river parting, as it was in the case of Moses, when a community was essentially uh, despondent by the fact that they've come to the end, but hope in God and divine leadership was sufficient for the security and passage. When that see divided into two. So I think that's the first thing, hope. And I guess the other thing is, is that with hope, you also give vision. And vision is something which is important. How does this community, how do we as a community go forward? What's the vision? And so I guess the vision, or at least the tools to define the vision um, within our community has switched uh, to Zoom and to other forms of social media. And we're using communication this type of communication to be able to, um, I think, unite with our congregations. Whether you're speaking from an altar or whether you're in a mosque or whether you're speaking from the podium, I guess it's about communication. You know, God communicates with us through a book um, or through prophets. And in the very same way as technology has advanced, we're really taking that message of God and we're transferring it via the social media and all the, the social networks that we have, the Zoom, this WhatsApp, Twitter, whatever, whatever it may be, and communicating this message to our wider audience. So I don't think the, the essential has changed. You know, the essence is the same. I think the mode of expression may have changed, um, but that one message, the word, the unity behind it, it's, it's the same. So I don't see really much of a difference. I guess we're physically separated, but in terms of a collective, we're still very much united. And pragmatically, I think, you know, we've reacted differently from maybe the different denominations within Islam, at least within Europe and in the United States. And what's happened is that everything has come onto Zoom. Um, In the evenings, for example, we're breaking our fast uh, with our congregation, our families via uh, this particular network. And I guess at the same time, you know, we're, we're waking up in the morning and starting our fast. So for those people who don't sleep and, you know, they're, they're having breakfast at 2.33 in the morning, um, they're corresponding, they're, they're, in, they're in links with their communities. So, you know, I don't see it as a very big change. I think the mode of communication may have changed, but I think the essence is still the same. Yeah, <clears throat> it resonates tremendously i i, I think that uh, thank you uh, imam for that perspective it's 
um, it definitely helps to hear that, you know, that we're sharing this kind of experience in our religious lives, which, you know, religious life, I, you know, certainly, I think in all, in all areas or in, in you know, in, in most aspects, certainly with Islam and Judaism, it's, it's profoundly social, mm -hmm. you know, where we are, we are constantly coming together uh, for, for worship, for, uh, you know, for, for recreational purposes. I mean, it is community very much at its heart. And so that's essentially been removed. Um, I agree absolutely with the imam that, uh, you know, at the core, our work has not changed. You know, at, at the core, um, you know, religious, um, theological-based uh, leadership in life is about cultivating our spiritual selves, cultivating, you know, our giving, like he said, vision towards light, higher truths. It is when, you know, so it's one thing when you're doing that with life kind of running along as we are used to it running along, you kind of know the name of the game. I do think that there is a profound challenge in this on, on, on a few levels. I think one is that we're, we're, as the Imam said, you know, this is, the one word that's been used, I think, more than ever during this is unprecedented. Everybody's saying it's unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. Okay, I mean, you know, as, as, as uh, Ecclesiastes writes, King Solomon, according to our tradition, there's nothing new under the sun. There may not, may not have been exactly like this, but, you know, as the Imam said, I, I, you know, I, we had, uh, you know, much of my community is uh, Iraqi, originated in, in uh, Baghdad. There was cholera outbreaks, you know, where where half of the population died. Every rabbi, I mean, they had to they had to they needed to get a rabbi from Aleppo, Syria, in order to be able to lead the people because the rabbis had died. I mean, that, that is massive uh, casualty and, and tragedy. Mm. So I think that probably the biggest part of this for us, which is most difficult for us to manage, is its global element. First of all, that I think perhaps we could say is unprecedented, you know, at least in the consciousness that we all have, where we're constantly connected and the communication is as open as it is, and the isolated element. We, we have this, you know, we believe anyway that we really have this good understanding of microbiology and immunology, and so, you know, it's just shutting us all away from each other. Um, and I think that that's the, a major challenge, because we are so social in our nature as human beings to begin with. And those of us who are connected to religious communities have essentially tailored our lives in a very particular uh, social interaction, which I think for much of our communities is, is well, you know, um, it's well knit, if, you, if, if one can say. So that experience is, is a bit of grief, if not a lot of grief. And so I'm remembering, you know, I mean, to me, I think Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, and her, and her studies on grief are are really important. She's famous for the stages of grief, you know, that we go through for kind of putting those out. And I, you know, we, we kind of forget that we're all on one level or another, they're the leaders as well. I mean, I'm certainly not embarrassed to say I'm dealing with it as much as everyone else is dealing with it. And it's just as much of a trauma for me. Um, the denial of it, that's a big thing. And it's easy for us when we see other people denying to point our fingers, you know, and say, you know, why are you denying when all of us are doing that on some level or another, the, the, the anger, the bargaining, you know, am I going to go out on a nice day, you know, to, to, to Primrose Hill when everybody's lying out in the sun or, or not? Is that okay? Is it not okay? Should I open synagogue? Do I not open synagogue? And of course that becomes much more profound when you're dealing with it on a religious level. I mean, I'm sure the Imam has experienced this. I mean, I, I run, I lead the oldest Jewish community in the country. Uh, that means that, you know, we've been here for over 300 years. And so there is very well-established, you know, hierarchies, structures, procedures. Mm -hmm. And I'm dealing with, you know, questions of Jewish law that really we haven't dealt with in almost ever. So the question is, who can come to a funeral? Uh, how do we deal with the cleansing of the bodies? You know, as I know that, the you know, we share in our faiths. Um, if we're worried about, you know, uh, somebody who's died because of the virus. Uh, these are very difficult decisions that we have to make that have serious repercussions. And there's all this bargaining that's going on in terms of how it is that we deal with it. But a line from Viktor Frankl, you know, in, in Man's Search for Meaning has been a tremendous guide for me. And I've shared it with my community on more than one occasion. Viktor Frankl writes, you know, he just for 
you know, reference, I mean, I know I'm sure everybody's aware of who he is, but, but you know, he's, he went through five concentration camps, Viktor Frankl, and survived. You know, psychotherapist, existentialist. And he writes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, abnormal responses to abnormal situations are normal. That for me has been a tremendous comfort because you know when we're making our way as we go along, we can we can recognize that as as abnormal as this feels, the whole thing is very abnormal. So in terms of the spiritual guidance, it's it is making phone calls to the elderly that are isolated in their homes. It's supporting people for the Passover festival that we just went through, that it was going to be surreal for everyone. And being able to say, listen, these are the core elements of it. It's an abnormal time, abnormal responses are normal. This is the way that we're going to do it. But it reminds, as the Imam said, the core doesn't change. The, the, the ideals and the principles in our work essentially in that doesn't change. We have to adapt it, I think, to this situation. And that's part of the challenge to be able to learn and understand how to adapt. Um, but, but ultimately, I think with those kind of awarenesses, the awareness of the fact that it is grief and what comes with it, the awareness of the fact that it's an abnormal situation and what comes with it, and the understanding that as long as we as, the, as religious leaders have a strong sense of the core of our belief system and our, and our, you know, our, our connection to God, um, that we do our best to be able to, to put that out and to hold the hands of the community in the best way that we can. Mm. I guess I wanted to pick up on the note of procedural dicta, which in many ways adhere to religions and perhaps in the form of tradition, perhaps in the form of law, this fraught balance between innovation in a period which demands of us forms of innovation, demands of us dexterity, such that we're able to maintain the sense of spirituality, which is so core and essential as both of you put it, to religion, with the preservation of tradition and ensuring that beyond coronavirus, there maintains a certain reverence for traditions which would otherwise be observed in specific types of ways. And the two examples I want to bring up are, for example, within the Orthodox Jewish community, there having been 14 Sephardic Orthodox rabbis who are declared it permissible to conduct a shared seder over Zoom and that then being rolled back by the chief rabbis of Israel, who said that Passover Seder may not be held via video conference. And likewise, iftar for the Muslims or communal prayer during Ramadan. I was just wondering then, where do both of you see this very tenuous line between maintaining traditions which are so bound up in your respective religions and also ensuring that there is the level of flexibility such that people feel like they can maintain their spirituality in such a demanding time? Yeah, it's, yep. an, it's an excellent question and point. Uh, you know, the tension that, uh, you know, as you said, you know, it's fraught with tension. I think the tension that if I had to identify it um, is, is most prominent is on the one hand, we recognize that this is, this is a, a traumatic experience for so many people. And that, that has profound effects. I mean, it gets as far as to say that the mental health and well-being of an individual may reach extreme levels and that we have to be able to understand that, that if a person is isolated on Passover, let's say an older person is isolated on Passover, unable to contact the rest of their family, sitting with a matzah and a glass of wine, you know, and, and not even sure what to do, for a Seder because they've never really had to lead a Seder before. It's been years since they have. Um, we're talking about real health issues over here. We're talking about real questions of, of well-being, which, you know, I think this is shared in religion, you know, but certainly in Judaism, uh, you know, health and well-being and life uh, is, is paramount. It is paramount. And so that takes a tremendous amount of space. So that, that on the one hand is something that we have to really respond to and understand that times are different. And as I said, abnormal responses to abnormal situations. On the other hand, there is a, an extreme concern in the Orthodox world, which is heavily based, you know, it's important, I think, to identify that it's heavily based in law. So, you know, one of the things that I had in my community that we have in our community is a Beth did which literally means 
a house of jud judgment, right, which is essentially a rabbinic court. Um, and these rabbis, these scholars are tasked with adjudicating Jewish law, you know, how to, how to apply the tenets of Jewish law to the modern situations that we, we, we experience. And that they've been working overtime lately because there's so much that's coming out and that, you know, this is one of the questions, but what's the concern on the other end of this, which is what creates, creates the tension, is when we permit what we permit during this time, when we open the doors of what we open, if we choose to and, and find it appropriate to during this time, how do we then reform that when we come back into our regular, you know, life, if, if it is going to go back to being whatever, in whatever way, you know, as it was before. Um, and the judgment at the, at the nexus of those two elements is really what, where, where the tension lies. And so you have these 14 rabbis that you mentioned that said, you know something, Zoom seders, yes, we'll allow that. And that gets into some very technical questions of Jewish law, you know, on, on what we call Yom Tov, which is, essentially the, the, the day of the festival that we treat as Sabbath. Yeah, so we're not lighting fire and we're not, uh, you know, doing things that are essentially recognized as creative work. And there's a whole bunch of principles and details that apply to that. Is electricity fire? Yeah, and, and do we allow for it to be done in this manner, in this circumstance, in order to be able to support health and life and connection? So clearly those 14 rabbis, Sephardi rabbis, and I will say, um, that in the Jewish Orthodox world, traditionally Sephardi, those who, who have originated in Spain and Portugal, North Africa, Middle East, have had traditionally overall a more pragmatic, um, human-centered approach to adjudicating Jewish law, you know, as opposed to uh, many Ashkenazi, uh, you, you know, Eastern European, uh, German, French Jews, who are much more per perhaps hard-lined in terms of their application of law. So these rabbis said, you know, something, it's not fire. We have tradition that we've used electricity, you know, when, since it started, you know, on Yom Tov. And given these circumstances, we will allow. The chief rabbis um, were looking at it more on the other end of that tension that I described. You know, if we allow this, then what? Are, are people going to be able to differentiate? Is, there go, is, is the entire thing going to unravel? Is it worth, you know, uh, a grandmother's uh, health and well-being in, in her flat on, on, on Passover night to give her the access if it's going to unravel the, the, the structure of all of it? And again, I'm not, I'm, I kind of see both sides of it. I tend to lean towards the former rather than the latter. Um, you know, the chief rabbi of Israel is my uncle, and uh, I'm very close with him. I have a personal relationship with him. I understand why he, he did what he did, but it's, it's a really difficult line to hold. And because we don't have, you know, in, in Orthodox Judaism, uh, a central ruling authority, uh, we are essentially left to the opinions. And, mm -hmm. um, and that comes down to the local authorities. I've ended up ruling for my own community and my congregation on either side of that debate, given the circumstances that were brought to me and questions that were given to me. But yes, it is quite, quite a challenge. I'd like to mimic um, some of what the rabbi has said, and I think he's wonderfully contextualized the situation. I think we're also a very legal uh, tradition um, because of which we faced a number of problems. So starting off with burials. Now, of course, we had to clean the body in a particular way. And huge questions have been asked, how do we do this? Do we have enough PPE kits? In fact, just going back three weeks ago, there was a whole issue of cremation. So we had to clear that up. I think there was an anxiety in the Muslim community yes. that our bodies might be cremated. Yes. And so um, I think Nash Shah, MP, with the help of the Board of Deputies and others, put together a case to try and rebuttal that. And the clarification did come out to say that, no, we're not cremating your bodies, um, but there will be challenges. So I guess with the shrouding, with the cleaning now, let's say, for example, a mosque, a center doesn't have the ability to clean, doesn't have the PPE kit required. What do you do then in that situation? And there are places in Europe, for example, um, such as in France, where you're actually not allowed to clean the body, you know, regardless of whether you have PPE kit or not. In that situation, then what do you do? How do you bury the body? Do you bury it in the casket? Do you take it out the casket? So there's been quite a a few technical questions that have been put to us um, and how we react to that. And again, as you know, there are certain principles of priority 
um, at least within our jurisprudence, that if um, there is a particular government decree that you're not allowed to, let's say, take the body out of the plastic bag that they've put the body in, and you can't clean it, then what do you do? Then in that situation in France, we did say, look, bury the body without um, cleaning the body. However, the prayer rites, the burial rites have to be recited. Um, in no circumstances are we allowed to cremate the body, for example. Or then you've got other issues that we're facing in terms of fasting. Um, are doctors exempt from fasting, for example? And the ruling behind that was, well, actually, no, as, as primary, they're not exempt. However, if it's a hazard to their life, if it's going to cause um, undue problems, make them ill, lead to their death, then of course they don't need to fast. Um, but this was, this was a question from a lot of people who were saying, well, you know, if, if our mouths are dry and we can't drink, then we're more prone to coronavirus. What should we do in the situation and so forth? And I guess the primacy is of fasting. But if your life is in danger, you don't need to fast. So up to the extent that certain scholars came out to say, well, you know, you can chew, uh, I think, sugar-free chewing gum, for example. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's sugar-free is because sugar gives you energy. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, mm -hmm. um, I think that there have been um, innovation. And I think that innovation is not a wrong thing. It's not something which is bad. But I guess at the same time, one has to contextualize. On the one hand, you have literalists, literalists who say, well, this is the letter of the law and this is what you have to do. And I think this... I think then there's the group that are contextualizing things to say, well, look, there is a reason why this has been prescribed in a particular context. Let's contextualize this. There, is, there, there are rules in terms of priority and primacy is of life and saving life. And so therefore, let's do that. And I completely uh, understand when the rabbi talks about um, Zoom, let's say, for example, you know, with Seda um, and mental health. So you know, we have issues of mental health as well and of primacy of mental health and you know as he rightly said and as he's put it in uh, the way that i should have framed it as well in the sense that we're all suffering in some shape or form mm. you know to be in isolation is very difficult i'm meant to be in edinburgh i'm actually in london um, i'm not with my congregation because when the ban came in the travel ban or um, the idea of self-isolation i happened to be in london so i'm away from my congregation here I am in London, self-isolating. And of course, it does take a toll. You know, after, after a day or two or three or four, you do feel like wanting to go out and socialize. We are social beings. And so it does have an impact. But I guess it's our faith um, that allows us to overcome these challenges. And again, it's not wrong to say that I'm suffering. You know, it's not wrong to reach out to an imam or even a rabbi or a priest or your friends um, to say that I'm suffering and you know recently a friend of mine from another faith did reach out to say that look if, if you feel that you're by yourself if you feel that you're suffering do give me a call and that was you know the profoundly touching and I think that's something that's um, I guess the beauty of humanity that regardless of faith we are reaching out and you know just to give you some I, I guess it was phenomenal news for my community when the rabbi wrote a letter and reached out to us in Ramadan at the beginning of Ramadan. And, you know, and it was so heartfelt. I put it up on Facebook and the comments from a cross section of society from India to Pakistan, to Australia, to the Middle East, to Europe, to America, to the UK, how touched they were that at this moment, I guess, of um, when Muslims are observing, uh, worship and at the same time is very testing for them because Ramadan is a month of communities coming together. It's a social month that uh, the senior rabbis of the Sephardi community in the UK have actually given such a wonderful message. And it's kindness like that that puts things into context. It's kindness like that that at least tells us that there is light um, at the end of the tunnel. It's, it's touching messages that tells us that humanity hasn't lost its way yet. And even though we were expecting at the beginning of this, we thought, well, all hell's going to break loose once they socially isolate us. Within three weeks, there's going to be rioting and people are going to be you know, attacking one another and all sorts of kind of uh, confusion and mm -hmm. the collapse of this social fabric might take place. But what you're seeing after six weeks is that religious communities are still leading the way. They're still touching people. 
you know, they're still helping one another. And, and I guess this interfaith relationship is really working. You know, I'm getting a lot of support, a lot of um, solace and what the rabbi has said, his well wishes to us in our community. And I think that's quite profound that even though we're six weeks into a, what is categorized as a crisis or unprecedented crisis because of the global nature of what this symbolizes, but we are still working together and we're looking at it as humanity. You know, as the Quran says, Ya ayyuha nas. And nas, I would interpret it as humanity. It's not appealing to just one person. It's looking at humanity. And where God does talk to humanity at times, it may talk to individuals at times. We have in the Quran, it talks to the people of the book, the Abrahamic faiths. It talks to others. It talks to Muslims. It talks to the elite from the Muslims, but then it also talks to humanity. And I think that this idea of humanity is important. And I think the only way we're going to get through this is together because it's so global. It's a problem for humanity. And I think that we, as humanity, will get through this. As churches close, as synagogues close, as mosques close, as temple close. As a Sephardi friend of mine said, you know, he phoned me up one morning at nine o'clock and he said, well, God's chucked us all out. <laughs> you know, he's, he's closed the doors of the mosque. And the rabbi will know who I'm talking about. You know, he's closed the doors of the mosque. Mecca's closed, Medina's closed, Nejef is closed, Karbala's closed, Jerusalem is closed. He's kicked us out. But actually, has he really kicked us out? Or has he divorced us from our formal places of worship to say, now develop a more personal connection with me? Mm, mm, mm. And you know, the Bible is there. Mm. Uh, the Quran gives us lessons whereby sometimes we have to go back into ourselves to redevelop that personal connection. You know, Moses going away from his people is a sign of that. You know, he could have been with his people, but no, God instructs him to go away from his people. And where you have these retreats for 40 days, I guess, what's the purpose of that? And I think today I'm realizing more than ever, it's to really develop that personal relationship with God. So yes, with the challenges, that there are moments of, I, could, I would say, hope. Um, and of course, there's moments that we have an opportunity to reconnect with God. Mm. Beautiful. Absolutely so. Thank you for those remarks, both of you. And... On a similar matter then, what has been interesting to me reading the news in specific parts of the world, in America at the moment, for example, protests about religious freedom and yoking together the metaphysical components that the both of you refer to, that there exists faith and that is still something you can practice. Your spirituality is something you can cultivate in isolation, yoking that metaphysical aspect of religion with the physical aspect of religion and saying that to be denied the physical is to be denied your access to religion writ large. And what I was wondering with the boat, which the both of you have touched on transiently was what does it mean then to find community and spiritual companionship in a time of such isolation, specifically because religion for many religious people is an infrastructure through which they live their lives. It is, for example, during Ramadan that you connect with friends, you connect with family personally. So it's not just the relationship that religious people have with their religious leaders, but also which religious people have with in themselves within their own communities. And I was wondering then what the both of you have done to cultivate those religious communities, which come together through congregation which may not be a direct interface between you and the community, but maybe within communities, particularly for minority religious groups in the UK, as the Savadi and the Shia communities are. Um, I can say that, you know, I, I, when it, when it, when kind of first started with the isolation, I, I, I sensed almost immediately the, the fear, the uneasiness, um, the apprehension that everybody was feeling, you know, and it was communicated t kind of towards me. It's like all the rivers run into the, <laughs> into my, my space. And I, and I had, I had felt very keenly that there was this tremendous apprehension of what are we going to do if we're locked away in our, in our homes. And I, and I do have to say that although I don't think it is the first time the world has seen such things, it is the first time that we've seen it in this way 
And one of the graces of God, in my opinion, that we have in this time is the technology to be able to connect virtually, if not physically. Um, you know, the, the fact that any of us can broadcast to the world for all intents and purposes, you know, if, if somebody wants to connect, it's not that difficult to be able to do so, is, is grace. It is, it, is, it is a kindness of God. It's an opening for us to be able to say, listen, we do need the time alone and to introspect, as the imam was saying, and it resonates very deeply with me, what he said about that, that, you know, part of our spiritual lives is to be able to pause and have silence and be with ourselves and to kind of look at ourselves. There's no question that that's a part of this, but our ability to be able to connect, you know, with Zoom and, and FaceTime and Instagram Live, and whatever it is, that, you know, those things are, are, are tools and we have an opportunity to use those tools for high um, benefit. So the, one of the first things that I did when I, when I sensed this was coming on is I said, I committed to giving a 30 minute talk every night. Mm. Um, and those have been tremendously well received and I'm thankful that they've been well received, but, but people have just communicated less on the content, although, you know, people have, have, have liked the content and more on just the value of being able to have that connection mm. in whatever way we've been able to have it and that there's been a, a thought that's been supporting or encouraging or there's been opportunity to have dialogue in that way that is kind of stepping that that is not 100 percent focused on the virus and what we're reading in the news i mean i'm sure that we're having a difficult time kind of withdrawing from news if at all we are you know where there's just constant headlines coming up and what we're going to make of all of the the economic situation and the health situation and the infrastructure situation and so on to be able to just come back and have a conversation about our humanity about our thought about our our high our high truths um has been tremendously helpful and what's ended up happening you know i used to be uh, a rabbi in new york i headed a an an a, a, a second a, a primary school there and I and, and a congregation there and I've been I've you know this this ultimately has given me an opportunity to completely reconnect with the entire community there and so like as you say there are these these satellites so to speak around the globe and this technology has given us the opportunity to be able to genuinely interact in a real way um, with each other um, and so to me, I'm very grateful for that because it's certainly something that I would not have done in this way had we not been in this situation. But, but this definitely opens up the time for people, first of all, to listen, to, to, to actually have the opportunity without all of the other, you know, distractions to stop and, and connect um, regularly. Um, and, I, and I look forward to that, to, you know, to being able to bring that with us as we come out of this, that, that hopefully on whatever level, the bonds that we make, the actions that we take during this time, I believe very much will define how it is that we come out and move forward. And, and uh, the, the connections that the various communities in the world uh, have during this time I, I, will, will, be, will be quite meaningful, I hope, will be quite meaningful. So yes, there are Sephardi communities um, all over, and that's not to exclude the Ashkenazim, you know, they're, they're, they're there and they're connecting and, they're, you know, it's, it's nice because people are saying, you know, if I wanted to go to a lecture, I went to a lecture. Now I have like a potpourri of, of options to see, you know, where I want to go. If I want to pray in this synagogue, I pray because we have virtual prayers as well. I want to go to, to a synagogue uh, in, in Australia. I go to a synagogue in Australia. I want to go to a synagogue in Baghdad. Well, there's no, I don't know how much is running in Baghdad at the time, but whatever it is, there's this opportunity to be able to kind of, you know, globe trot virtually mm. and be connected. And that's something that it definitely has been a silver lining in this. I completely agree with that. And we have similar parallels that I guess the mood of um, community has changed. But with this virtual community just this morning, I was looking at a list of 15 speakers. Now you've got a choice. You can either listen to so-and-so or you can listen to so-and-so in this Ramadan. So it's, it's fascinating how the mood has changed. And your audience has increased, it's become more global. And I guess, you know, three weeks ago, I was lecturing for the Essex community. And so it's the first time I've ever used this uh, device. I think it was Cisco or something. So 745, Quran recitation. So you logged on, Quran recitation. 8 p.m., five minutes, you had some kind of poetry. And then there I was, 40 minutes. And then after that, at the end, 
they had a prayer, short prayer, followed by a virtual tea. So everyone kind of stayed on. And for five minutes, they showed their cups of tea. <laughs> and they drank tea together because it's a tradition. Uh, and after that, they left. So I think people are trying to normalize it. And I think it's important for our elders, especially for those who may have lost a spouse, for those who are alone. And I could see the vast majority of people who had their camera switched on were actually elders. And they were so focused and so engaged. And I think it's very important that this virtual community is there for those people who may be lonely and for our elders, uh, because for our elders, this is the community. And uh, as you rightly said, you know, our communities have circled around our centers. You know, I think when my father bought his first house, it was very close, literally a minute and a half away from the mosque. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that he wanted to raise his children so he could take them to the mosque and God forbid he got old or something happened or all of us get old, but something happened, his children could go by themselves to the mosque. And most of our communities across the West are really communities that have grown because of the mosque, the centrality of the mosques. So the first thing you have is a mosque, and then after that you have a community that grows around it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the nature of a Shia community. You know, let's say, for example, and regardless of wherever you're from, you know, whether you're from Iran or Iraq, or let's say Uganda in the, in the 70s, early 70s, when the East African community came to the United Kingdom, they built a community based on their mosque, and then everything else was in the radius of the mosque. So with that, it's, I thought initially it was going to be a challenge, but the community adapted. And there you are, you've got virtual tea going on. But I guess you also have a potential to listen to people. And you get this list at the beginning of Ramadan, 15 speakers you can listen to. You can listen to so-and-so in New York. You can listen to so-and-so in Toronto. You can listen to so-and-so in Australia. And I guess in a way it's good, but I guess for some of our lecturers, it may not be a good thing because it mm -hmm. squeezes their audience. <laughs> so now they have, to, they have to really study and work hard and be more charismatic. Step up your game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> step up your game. Yeah. So I think it's challenging for them now as well. Yeah. And, um, and, and I guess, you know, I think this is, I think this is a, a mode that we can take forward you know, in the future because I don't think this is the end of it. You know, I think that, you know, God forbid, but it's, it's going to happen one year or two. If we don't get a, an antidote for this, an antivirus, who knows, maybe seven months down the line, you may have to face another 40-day or six-week, seven-week uh, self-isolation uh, period of self-isolation so I guess going forward this this may be a mode and this also may be a mode for people who are living away from their centers and mosques to be able to communicate via zoom you know I do know that in our community in Vancouver let's say that there are a number of people who live on, on an island I think I, I can't remember what the island is called but an, an island which is 35-40 minutes away from Vancouver proper and this gives them an opportunity um, or gives the wider community an opportunity to feel what they're feeling. Then in the month of Ramadan, they would have to go via Facebook Live or via some live stream to listen to their prayers and to listen to their lectures. And now we're all in this situation, so we will appreciate that. So yeah, I think the mood has changed, but I think we're a lively community. You know, we'll continue to have our cups of tea and I guess the other thing is, and I, you know, I'll be really honest, I've benefited because every evening I get a pack, packed meal for breaking my fast and it's outside my door. So when I, also when I open the door, it's stacks of stuff, which I can't even finish. And, you know, there I am and it runs through until the morning. So I'm, I'm loving it. You know, so I'm, I'm getting free food. And <laughs> thank, thank you. So there we are. I was wondering on the flip side of those more auspicious elements, which both of you emphasized of having that globally entwined communicative fluidity of having that infrastructure set up by the internet and different types of innovations of the like. I know within the Christian community, for example, there was a swathe of paranoia amidst different priests, different preachers, ones who were paranoid, for example, about, losing donations on which their churches were subsisting or losing followers, dispersing communities. Exactly the flip side of the comments you make about having optionality and generating internal competition within religions, which doesn't seem like a natural concordance because 
to have competition within religion seems metaphysically against the spirit of the religion. So I was wondering if you two could weigh in on these different discourses that are occurring of religious leaders fearing what this means for their own practicing of their faith, for their own carrying out of what they see to be their duty, their obligation, and how, in your opinion, religious leaders ought to reframe their obligations given this newfound context? Well, the economic question is very serious. I mean, it's a very serious one, I think, uh, you know, which connects to much more than just being able to attend church or not, you know, or to be in the, in the place of worship. I mean, everything essentially is frozen. And, and, and unfortunately, I don't know, again, I don't know how it is in the, in the Shia Islamic community, and I'm interested to hear, but um, charities generally in a time of economic crisis, the likes of which we're experiencing, uh, are not at the top of people's list, mm. unfortunately. And that includes the synagogue and the, you know, the community centers, unfortunately. Uh, so that's been quite a severe blow, I will say. Um, and we are looking at how it is that we kind of um, lay that in to the current, uh, I guess you could say programming, you know, current, current offerings and uh, opportunities for the, for the community to be able to connect and to have their, their membership essentially in the, in the religious environment. Um, and it is, you know, we have to think about how it is that we do it because again, it's another thing that is not normal. It's not what we usually do. And so it's another thing that we kind of have to wrap our heads around. Oh, we're doing it this way now, which only reminds us that things are not normal or not the way that we were used to. And so there's that challenge around it. Um, but I do think that uh, it is, it is, you know, it's prompting so much, so much on so many levels, as you said, a question of innovation. And I, I do think that those who are able to innovate in this time will, in the way that's needed and, and necessary, will, will, be, will, will be able to genuinely bring this through. Um, and it's very likely, and I believe very strongly that it will be the case that the way that we come through this will change how it is that we do things for the future for quite, you know, uh, for a while. Um, we will see, you know, the things that we never thought to do before, that we do now, will be seen coming out of this, you know, why didn't we do it before? There's no real reason, you know, necessarily why we can't. Um, I think there's a lot of that going on. I don't think that that's only happening, obviously, in religious circles. I think that's happening in corporate circles, in, in, in you know, in, in business circles, in, in social circles all over the place where, where we're seeing, you know, we would have never done this. We, didn't, we would have never been open to this. And yet here we are doing it. And it's working in a way that may be very, very beneficial. So um, that component is running through so much. I mean, so our meetings consist, you know, of, of our staff and so on are, are, are all essentially consisting of, well, we've changed things up and how do we, how do we adjust our vi viability needs, you know, our, our needs for being viable and, and assuming, you know, that religion in general, <laughs> you know, needs to be able to find its viability in a modern world. This, if anything, has prompted us to kind of like re-examine re that and be almost uh, emboldened to be able to innovate in ways that we otherwise wouldn't have, have done before, I think. Mm. Well, I think there's also an anxiety from our part that will the uh, number of con congregants coming to the mosque decline after this? as people get used to Zoom or they get used to live stream? And will they want to just spend, let's say a, a Friday or a Thursday night at home, um, just listening by a live stream? And that may be a problem for um, tradition in the sense that we thrive off community, we thrive off a congregation coming together. <coughs> you know, our prayers in congregation are very important. Mm. So, you know, that's something that um, is an anxiety. However, I think in terms of charity, um, potentially charity going to the mosque um, in terms of surplus may have diminished, but uh, at least within our tradition, we know that giving charity is a way of form um, of removing uh, any kind of tragedy or difficulty 
coming onto coming onto ourselves. And because this issue is such a global issue, you know, sometimes the power of prayer requires a bit of a supplement. And so we do give charity at this time. We do sacrifice at this time. Um, and the purpose of it is to ward off evil or to ward off any kind of distress. And so on a, I, I believe on a regular basis that our community members, if not all of them, but there is a sizable portion of our community who would, uh, be it something very small, but do take out charity um, to ward off evil, to ward off tragedy. And I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing is, is that as far as our clergy or our clerics are concerned, um, some of them have actually increased their profile because of lecturing online now. So they have YouTube channels yeah. and they're making money. It's a form of revenue. And, you know, and let's be honest, you know, some of them, or at least a great majority of them that I know, have their direct debits set. And you know, if they're delivering a speech, they'll get paid for it. And I think it's very good for the tax man because everything's so open now. Everything's coming into the account and, and, and the people are benefiting financially um, because of this. And I guess, you know, they, they don't need to. Uh, and again, it's, I guess it's a change of methodology. But um, I think the majority of mosques um, who are asking for the services of, let's say, a particular imam are also paying them. And I think that that's an incentive in and of itself. It's not something which, which is just one would say for the pleasure solely for the pleasure of God but it is partially for the pleasure of God and partially for the pockets of the person so it's become slightly more pragmatic and and I think that pragmatism is good but hopefully we don't lose the essence of it either so ho hopefully it's not just for the ratings and hopefully it's not just for payment or you know remunerations so yeah so there's a number of challenges and once we're over the bridge and it will be important to see then how our communities react. I wanted to move to questions of particularistic criticisms about religious minorities, because it is no secret that being from religious minorities leaves you open inherently to specific types of criticisms when such crisis strikes societies. And I want to invoke, for example, Shias returning from Iran to Pakistan, or writ large in general were in many circles, in many different societies, decried for bringing the virus back from Iran. Equally, Orthodox Jewish communities in New York were portrayed as being intransigent and regressive, extrapolating from individual circumstances. So I wonder about your roles as religious leaders, litigating different social concerns which emerge from times of crisis, specifically ones which disproportionately target your communities in virtue of your minority status and how it is to interact with this while still maintaining a circumspection, still ensuring that people within your community are heeding regulations without it seeming like it is your community which is specifically culpable, for example, as the media may portray it in specific circumstances or as maybe the slight in specific circles. Thank you. So just to touch on what you just mentioned. Um, of course, we have um, a series of pilgrimages that throughout the year, the Shia community will do. Uh, perhaps they will go to Mecca, Medina. Perhaps they'll go to Iraq or Iran. So I think within, within the Western context, it was dealt far better that for those people, let's say, who are returning from Iran, a very small group of people who were, who were coming back to the West, um, the media didn't really throw things that they would say, throw, throw the toys out of the pram. But as far as Pakistan was concerned, I was monitoring that. So there was, a, there was a particular group of, I think, 30 people who were coming back via road uh, from Zaidan to Pakistan. And um, they were held up at the border. And for right reasons, they were quarantined. But the facility for quarantining was such that if one person had it, it would, he would have spread it or she would have spread it to the, the whole 30 because they were all bunched together and um, pretty much in no man's land. And that's why I think that the government did a good job. Um, and there was a claim that an individual who had come back was the first case of coronavirus, which later on turned out to be false. Um, firstly, he didn't have coronavirus. And, um, and secondly, he wasn't, he wasn't the first case. 
So I guess there's a lot of negative propaganda and this feeds into the sectarian narrative. Mm. Um, you know, you've also had cases of people coming up from Mecca, for example. And again, who was to know that this was to become such a pandemic? And I guess it comes back to the laws of the country. And for those countries who were quarantining for 40 days, 14 days, that was a very good thing. For those countries who may not have, I know people who were coming back to the UK um, from Iran and they were told to quarantine themselves for seven days in their homes, which they did. So I guess for people who were on pilgrimage, be it to Iraq or Iran or Saudi or Palestine or, or Israel or whatever, whatever it may have, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that they weren't to know it wasn't legal then or there wasn't a blockade then. And now that they've come back, the vast majority of them have gone into quarantine or everyone that I know went to quarantine for 14 days or seven days. So I think that with the Pakistani media, it was a bit unfair for them to spread uh, false rumors like this. And I think it comes down to the sectarianism, which is prevalent in Pakistan. It is a Shias of it's been target killings of Shias. We, we know Shias in Pakistan have been killed. You know, you've got over 30,000 Shias in the last 25 years who have been killed because of target killings, doctors, lawyers, and so forth. So I guess that's more of a political issue as opposed to a religious issue. And I think that it was identified as such. Uh, going forward, though, what I would say to the Pakistani community is do stay at home. You know, don't go out. I know it's uh, the month of Ramadan, but don't be the cause of um, anti-Shia hatred. Stay at home, um, social distance, worship from home, especially where you know, you know, for example, that there could be a case of Islamophobia in the West, for example, and in, this, in this country, in the United Kingdom, you know, we've had discussions to say that we have to be more stringent in, on the rules because otherwise, even if two people congregate somewhere, let's say, it could lead to a spike in Islamophobia. And this has been false news. So, for example, in the last three weeks or so, there's been false news that Muslims are going into mosques and they're praying. And that's not the case. You know, we had a meeting only a couple of days ago to say there's no mosque that's open. Yes, one mosque in East London opened only for volunteers to go in and to help out with the shrouding and the washing of a particular dead body. Um, and so I think what's important to bear in mind is that there will be people who will try and capitalize or far right or, you know, Islamophobes or Shia phobes will try and capitalize on this. And I think that we need to make sure that we don't give a, even a small opening for them to do so. So yes, we have been emphasizing more so that it's more important for the Muslim community to observe all of the rules and regulations. And if, if you're allowed to go for a walk for half an hour, make sure that you don't go for a walk only if it's necessary, because otherwise we will be the brunt, we'll be at the brunt of Islamophobia. And unfortunately that is the way that things are. And we've got to be cognizant of that. So we are facing more than just one crisis, but at the moment we're facing a second crisis, which is Islamophobia. And as Shias, we're facing Shia phobia in certain parts of the world. And as you mentioned, the example of pilgrims returning from Iraq or Iran. Mm. Yeah, I, I, it also <laughs> resonates a great deal. Uh, it's very different circumstances, but, but resonates a great deal. You know, I, I, we have, you know, evidence of, of some, you know, ultra orthodox communities around the world, really, you know, in Israel, in New York, even here in, in, uh, in London, which for, for these groups, um, practice is so central to their religious observance that, um, you know, changes as abruptly as this are profoundly difficult to digest and accommodate, you know, into their daily lives. They, 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 they are quite rigid, you know, in their, in their behavior and practice. And I do think that it goes back to the question of denial. Yeah. And I don't say that in a judgmental way whatsoever, again, back to the Kubler-Ross model and where, you know, if we're dealing with grief, there are different levels of denial that we go through. And, and it is a normal human response to, to express denial to this kind of grief, you know. Um, and I think that that was much of what was going on in these circles. I don't know that it was all of what was going on, that it describes or explains the entirety, you know, at the base of the behavior, um, but definitely part of it. 
Um, and so there was like, you know, a very hard line that the leaders of those communities needed to take in order to kind of curtail the, the way that the community was dealing with it. So very simply put, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, that uh, I have, you know, any, any profound insights into, you know, what the intricate details were. To me, it, it was quite simple that there was tremendous denial on the sense of some of the ultra-Orthodox communities, you know, the orth you know within Judaism, difficulty being able to accommodate it into a life that is extremely regimented and where their religious behavior is very, very firmly practiced daily. Um, and that's part of the, the, I would say, the beauty of their religious life to them. This is, this is just, you know, their disciplined, um, uh, determined focus on their service of God. Uh, that's the way that they they have chosen to live. And so when you have something like this that throws a curveball into, into your whole system of living, it, is, it isn't uh, that easy to just kind of say, all right, well, we're going to do it this way now. You know, things as simple as just coming, you know, the prayers every morning in synagogue with a quorum of 10 men or more, which is an acquired requirement to, to have full prayers, what we call a minyan. Uh, to stop that in, in, in an individual's life who, whose essentially life revolves around those practices is profoundly um, traumatic and grief-stricken. And so there is going to be a high level of denial. And I think that in general, um, you know, listening to how the imam was describing, you know, the situation um, definitely resonates with how I was experiencing, I'm experiencing the situation, less so now. We are, we are in a fight and flight mode. It's, it's very much a part of how, how humanity is dealing with this. And the limbic system is just firing up. And so when we're in fight flight, it's, 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 it's very, one has to be extremely disciplined and conscious enough to be able to say, well, wait a minute, I'm doing all this blaming and I'm doing all this finger pointing and I'm doing all this judgment in order to protect my own feeling of uneasiness and instability. Um, and I think that's also part of the responsibility of good leaders. Good leadership uh, has responsibility to kind of like recognize limbic firings and come back into the prefrontal cortex and say, okay, you know, I need to be able to speak from this place of mind rather than this place of mind. Um, and I do think that the leadership did a fairly good job of that uh, in the Jewish community, but it was not easy. So while there is a need in, in, on the part of leadership to have the empathy and sensitivity and understanding as to why this behavior is happening, um, there is also a responsibility on the side of the leadership to say, and it cannot happen, mm. and to put very hard lines on that. So you know, my, in my broadcasts nightly at the beginning, I was saying it relentlessly. It was just a constant message that went out because people were saying, well, really? I mean, what's the difference? It's just like the flu. Is it going to be a difference? Is there, you know, so I had to really put that out very strongly. And, and the rabbis in my community did the same. And the rabbis that are my colleagues around the world, you know, that we, that we essentially identify with each other as being part of, you know, this collective, this collective philosophy and essentially worldview, we're doing the same. And that helped people all over. You know, I know that people in New York, people in Israel were sharing guidelines of, of you know, uh, religious practice that had to be profoundly changed during this time. So that was also a very great sense of camaraderie and solidarity in where you were not the lone individual saying, listen, this is what we have to do. But you were able to say, listen, this is what we are doing here. Look, here, look, he's doing it in Israel. They're doing it in New York. We're doing it, you know, here. And, and this is what we need to do collectively. And that helped tremendously to deal with the calming of the fight flight mindset and coming more into this, okay, you know, this is us together mindset and how do we do this? Mm. Thank you for both of your insights there. If I may, one last question, I'm wary of your time as well. Uh, so it may be a briefer question. And both of you did accentuate some elements of this in your responses. In a time where it's so tempting to be inward facing while we are plight stricken, both the Shia and Sephardi communities transcend borders in a monumental way it is the case that both communities are heavily diasporic heavily transnational and when so much is concentrated on and pivots around the nation because of pragmatic policy matters that was being determined at the national level i wondered what both of you thought obligations were to keep in mind 
communities of your faith abroad and also how to build that solidarity when we're no longer able to travel, when we face different policies, when there isn't necessarily the same capacity to celebrate, to congregate, even with the advent of internet. I wonder where that solidarity and then where that obligation comes into play when we're talking about such transnational faith. The sharing, I think, is, is extremely important. It is, you know, it may sound simple, but it really is almost as simple as that. The sharing, the conscious, active sharing, uh, you know, being able to reach out to rabbis that are your colleagues in a different country that you don't necessarily speak to on a regular basis, that you're not necessarily working with daily, even monthly. But here, knowing we're in this together, is, as you know, they're fond of saying nowadays, which is, which is very much the case. Uh, you know, there's, at our core, we are human, and that's what makes us all vulnerable to this situation, nothing else, and that we share. Uh, so to be able to, to speak to a colleague who, um, you know, is a friend and is in the same boat as you uh, and say, listen, this is what we're doing. What are you doing? How are things there? This is how things are here. Um, and I've received many such messages and I've tried to, you know, put out such messages to my friends and colleagues and people that I know, even cursorily, casually um, around the world. And I have to say, it's been extremely helpful for us to be able to to hold together during this time and i'm, I'm very humbled and, and deeply honored to hear that from the imam that our message to to the to the to the community the muslim community was well received um, and we mean it from the bottom of our hearts um, because it is it is a time in which we really do um, i believe it is a moral obligation upon us to hold our need or drive to point fingers and, and criticize, and to be able to recognize that what, that the vulnerable point for all of us in this pandemic is our humanity. And it is our humanity that must come in its strength to the forefront uh, at, at, the, at this time. Mm. Just to add, add to that, and thank you so much, Rabbi, for that. Um, it is our common humanity. It's a, it's a global issue, and it's an issue that's affecting all of humanity, and it's going to be humanity as a collective that's going to need to come together to overcome this. And I guess what gives me comfort are the tools that we have, is the fact that we have this form, platform of communication, because as our community really doesn't have a central location, but we're scattered across the world. Um, we've been able to keep in touch because of the internet and because of telephones and so forth. So I, I still look at it, things hope in, uh, with hope. And I think that there is a lot of hope in the world. And I think there is a lot of kindness. People are doing good actions. And with these good actions, I guess it lifts the morale and the spirit of the people. Um, just a gesture of kindness is so profound. Uh, the rabbi and his community, their gesture was so profound. Um, and it, it raises the morale of the people. And I think that's something which is important. Um, and I don't, I don't see that uh, going forward. Um, that I, don't, I don't see the doom and gloom that people talk about. You know, I feel that there are challenges, but I feel together we'll overcome these challenges. And I think that's what faith teaches us. We have faith in God. And so therefore, we do believe that there will be um, some kind of assurance from God uh, to help us overcome this and to go forward into what potentially could be a new type of world, um, a new type of setting. Uh, but we do have that belief. And you know, the Shia faith is a very messianic faith. It comes, from, it comes from a very kind of uh, messianic background whereby we do believe in savior. And I think you know, savior, a savior may have different modes, um, but I think at the moment, the collective goodness in humanity is in itself, I guess, a form of a savior for us, that there is good and there is a promise. And I think that you know, the promise of God will always come through, but we have to do our part and kindness, good gesture, 
compassion, charity, all of these things are very important for the actualization of this promise. So I have hope going forward and I think together we will get over this and I guess together we will be more prosperous. Amen. Thank you, Sayed and Rabbi, for your reflection, for your consideration, for embodying the hope so fundamental to faith. I wish you both a blessed time in and beyond lockdown. To you, your families, your congregations and communities abroad and hope to see your communities thriving after this lockdown, this period of coronavirus. So thank you so much for your insight. Amen, amen. An honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.